Good morning. morning. It's uh, a genuine delight to me to see you all this morning. It really is. And some people I haven't seen for a little while, which is even better. Um, In our uh, church reading plan, we're reading, um, or this week, we've been reading um, in the book of Genesis, uh, chapters 15 to 18. And I want to read to you chapter 15 this morning. Genesis chapter 15 from verse 1. Um, in in uh, the NIV, most of the versions I've seen, it, they've given it a title. And they've, they've, dis- they've called it the Lord's Covenant with Abram. Abram, of course, is the man who was later renamed by God as Abraham. Verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to bring you this this land to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. Got through the names, that's why I'm saying. <laughs> I was sure I was going to get tongue twisted there. Now, in the readings this week, buried in the readings of this week, there's possibly one of the most significant scriptures in the Bible. And it's particularly significant because this is the Old Testament and was written about 2,000 years before Jesus came. I wonder if you spotted it during your readings this week. I can see some nodding heads. But first, before I go to that verse, we need to go back 15 years or so to Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, God made some amazing promises to Abraham. Verse 2 of chapter 12, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And in chapter 12, verse 7, he says also, To your offspring, 
I will give this land. This is 15 years before God has made these promises to Abram. But by the time we get to chapter 15, he's beginning to have his doubts. And we read in chapter 15, verse 2, what I've already read. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And he goes on, you've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. He just can't see how God's promise to make him a great nation is, can possibly come true because he's got no children. It's reasonable. Eliezer, by the way, was one of um, his servants. And in that culture, if a man was childless, he could adopt a male servant into his family and that person, that man, will become his heir. Uh, and so this is what he was contemplating as a solution to the problem. After years of waiting for God's promise of children uh, to be fulfilled, he thinks there's no other way forward but to go down that path. But look at what God says in verse 4. This man will not be your heir, but a son of your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And then he takes him outside and he says, look at the sky. Can you count the stars? You probably can't. Well, I've got to tell you, your offspring is going to be as numerous as those stars. Wow. And then it says... In verse 6, Abram believed the Lord. It's been 15 years. Abram is now 90 years old and his wife is 80. And God says, I'm going to give you an insert. And it says, Abram believed. What incredible faith to believe something like that after all that waiting. And at his age and his wife's age. And in particular, it struck me when I was reading this and thinking about it. This man was not part of a big church with a lot of support and encouragement and fellowship like we have the privilege of and sometimes neglect, might I say. Um, Abram was on his own. Outside of his family, and we're not told anything about his family then and what faith they had, if any, in God. But apart from uh, Abram and his family, perhaps, no one outside his family that he knew of anyway uh, knew this God who had spoken to him 15 years ago and brought him into this foreign foreign land. He was on his own, but he believed. That's incredible. I find it hard enough to believe when I'm encouraged by all you lot. And I know that on my own, I would probably fall flat on my face, which is why I need to be among you. Never underestimate what you bring to the fellowship. Every single one of us is a vital part. Okay? Okay? We need to take, we need to receive, but we also are privileged to give in encouragement and support and prayer. Anyway, that's that's another sermon. I haven't got time for that. Um, But it struck me, this man on his own believed. What does it take for you and me to believe God? We've got 2,000 years of Christian history. We've got witnesses, eyewitnesses to God's power and reality, and yet we still find believing God quite difficult. Well, actually, if you read the whole story, so did Abraham. And this is the point. His faith is remarkable, but he also had plenty of doubts. Don't worry about doubts. Abraham had clearly been wondering what was going to happen to his wife and his household when he died. He had no heir. So he, he, he assumed he'd have to adopt Eliezer or there'd be nobody to look after him. There was no you know, um, social security in those days. Certainly not in the middle of where he was living. There was nobody to look after his, his, his possessions and his, his family. And he had to go down this route, or so he thought. And that wasn't the last time he, uh, he doubted God. If you read the whole story, it, it's basically in chapters 11 to, 11 to 25 of Genesis. If you read that through, you'll find how he doubted again and again and again. Um, again and again, he didn't trust God. But he took matters in his own hands to, to try and manipulate events so that what God said actually came to true. True. Do you ever try to do that? You know, you think, well, it's not going to happen. Uh, perhaps God wants me to do something about it. I know if I do this and I, I do that. Well, sometimes he does want us to do things. But the touchstone is, is what I'm going to do right? Is there any tinge of sin about it? Is it in any way disobedient of what he said to me or what his word says to me? Abraham did all sorts of things. In order to save his own life, he lied and deceived by pretending that his wife was his sister. And um, to solve the inheritance problem, after he'd been told by God that Eliezer wasn't going to be his heir, 
he thought of another idea. Well, actually, it was his wife's suggestion. She suggested he had a child by her maidservant. Sleep with her maidservant, Hagar. Hagar. Um, you read about that in, in one of the other chapters of Genesis this week. Now, understand this. This was the custom of the day. Um, if a man was childless, then he could have a child by his, his, his wife's servant, and that would become the heir. So he wasn't stepping outside of his culture, but he was stepping outside the will of God. Now, that's another challenge, isn't it? We can so often think, well, everybody does that today. This is the norm. That isn't what makes it right. Is it God's norm? We are called to swim against the tide. Our lives should be counter-cultural. Don't get me wrong. I've said it before. I'll say it again. It's not easy being a Christian. If you're finding it easy, you're probably not living as a Christian. Forgive me for that. <laughs> that may be a little bit on the hard side. But anyway, <laughs> um, it did strike me that... What's happening to the sound? I'm going up in the air for some reason. Um, it did strike me that that child he had by Hagar was actually his flesh and blood. So he probably thought, well, that's all right. Then God said, you know, your child will be your own flesh and blood. So he probably thought that was all right. But a little bit more thinking and the things that happened afterwards made it very clear he wasn't right. Um, but nevertheless... When I think about it, I'm not surprised he did that sort of thing. I'd have probably done the same. But in chapter 15, it says, quite clearly, Abram believed the Lord. I expect he did. But that didn't prevent him having more doubts in the future. Abram was like us. His faith came and went. You know, you can be on a spiritual high, believing, trusting, and five minutes later, it's the complete opposite. Isn't that true? Yeah. yeah. It was the same for this man. But it says in verse 6, Abram believed the Lord. And then God said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of Chaldeans to give you this land. Great. So there's a reassurance. What's Abram's response? Again in verse 8, eight but Abram said. Abram was a great man of the buts. But God, but God, but God. Do you do that? But God. You can't really mean that, can you? But God, what about this? But God, what am I supposed to do? But God, this isn't fair. But, 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 but. I love you, Lord, but. You know, if you said to your wife, husbands, I love you, but, I'm sure she'd be impressed. You know? And then there's all this business that after this, he says to God, how can I know? Don't we say that again and again? How can I know for sure? And do you know what God does? I think because Abram was in this particular situation where he had nobody else to reassure him. You've got the church. You've got the Bible. Because Abram was on his own, he does, there's all this business with the animals being cut in half and the smoking pot. That was God effectively placing himself on an oath to keep his promise. I could explain all that, but I haven't got time. He was prepared to do that, to say to Abram, well, if you won't believe my, believe my word, here is something you'll understand from your own culture. I place myself on oath to keep this. If I break my oath, may what happened to these animals be the same as happens to me. That's what it meant in the culture. Abram was human. This is the point. It's not a story. It's history. It's the history of a man with a family not unlike many other families in many other cultures and at many other times. People who believe God one minute and don't believe in the next. Sound familiar? Of course it does. But this is the man that God chose, nevertheless, to fulfill his purposes for mankind through. Incredible. God could never use me. Perhaps you think that. You are wrong. He used Abraham. He chose Abraham. Never mind all his doubts, his lies, his deceit, all the rest of it. God chose him and he said, I'm going to fulfill my purposes through you. In fact, I'm going to save the world through you. Abram didn't know that. But here's the best part of all. And this is where the, the verse I said was buried in this passage. Here it is. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. 
What's righteousness mean? It means being in the right with God. In the eyes of God, being right. Not in the, I'm right, sense of the word, but in the sense of being correct, morally, spiritually, and in every possible way, in line with the will of God. Pure, perfect, sinless. So you might see why this verse is so important. It's the foundation of the gospel message. It's the basis of God's plan to save the world. This is how we become acceptable to God despite our sins. By believing. By faith in the word of God who is Jesus Christ. Who died on the cross for our sins. So that we can be reconciled to God. So that our sins could be forgiven. By believing We're put right with God. Not the goodness or otherwise of the way we live, or not simply because God is love and therefore he will forgive us, but through the death of Jesus on the cross. Make no mistake, your forgiveness cost. The biggest price in history. God himself became a man and submitted to execution and torture on a cross. If there had been any other way, do you think he'd have done that? No. But he loved you so much he didn't want you to suffer for the things that you've done wrong. And me. Through the death of Jesus on the cross, when we put our trust in him, as Abraham did, we're made right with God. The barrier between us is removed. And life in eternity with him is secure. I don't know why, but when I came to church this morning, I got quite excited. I was... I was just so glad to be here and I met people and it was wonderful. I couldn't help smiling. It was great. And the early church, this message of forgiveness by the grace of God through faith in him, this is what they were so excited about. This is the message they were given by Jesus to tell the world. And it's the message that's been passed on through the centuries to you and me today. And many of us know that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it's summarized like this. Paul says, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It was not just an accident this morning that when we were singing, my God is so great, that John said, gracious. No, our God is a gracious God, doesn't it? That's the gospel. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And it goes on this, not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so no one can boast. It's all of God, all of it. He did it all on the cross. For us, and when we place our trust in him, we receive personally the benefits of his death for us, just as Abraham did, despite living 2,000 years before the event. Writing to the church in Galatia, Paul says, those who have faith are children of Abraham. And then it goes on, Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles, that's the non-Jews like you and me, unless some of you are Jews, would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. How about that? God announced the gospel. You know, it says in Scripture somewhere that when God's planning to do something, he always announces it to prophets first so that they can can know what he's going to do. Abraham was told about the gospel plan, it says. So those... When, uh, if, you, if you doubt about that, it's in those words, all nations will be blessed through you. Anyway, it goes on. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Wow, oh, what a title. The man of faith. I wish, you know, I'd love to have that name. As with Abraham, our standing before God is entirely dependent upon faith. Now that word faith, People use that word so casually today, don't you? Don't they? We hear people talking of people of faith. Have you come across that in the media particularly? People of faith as if it's just a case of believing in any God at all. People of faith. Doesn't matter what it's in. It isn't. Faith, saving faith, is not simple. It's not just a case of believing. It's a case of trusting. In the only true God who made heaven and earth and came to earth as a little baby to die for the sins of the world. We can't win a place in heaven by good deeds and neither did Abraham. So my question to all of us is this. Who or what are we trusting in for our salvation, for our eternity? 
for the forgiveness of our sins. Who or what are we trusting in? Do you know where you're going when you die? And when I say no, I mean no. Not just hoping like most people do. Or is that what you're doing? Just hoping. Hebrews chapter 11 describes all those who lived by faith before Jesus came, including Abraham. And at the end, there's an amazing statement. At the end of that chapter where he says, so-and-so did this by faith, this person did this by faith, and so on. It says they were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us. That's knowing Jesus. That was the something better. Those people who died in the years before the cross did not know Jesus in the flesh. But we do. That was the something better. And it goes on. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. We are one with every believer since the cross and before the cross. That's why the Old Testament is so important. God's plan of salvation began thousands of years before the coming of Jesus. That's why in the Gospels, the Old Testament is quoted so often. Have you noticed that? And when Jesus taught his disciples about himself, what did he use? He used the Old Testament scriptures. Do you remember after his resurrection, when he met some of the disciples on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection? It says in Luke 24, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, the Old Testament, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He didn't have the New Testament. He had the Old Testament. He said, look what it says here, 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 and here. Can you see this is all about me? Jesus runs right through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And when Philip was witnessing, here's a challenge. Do you think you could share the gospel with somebody using just the Old Testament? Philip did. He met this man on the road. He was an Ethiopian eunuch. You'll know the story, some of you. And um, the man was reading the prophet Isaiah. So Philip said to him, do you know what you're reading? Do you understand it? He said, no, I don't. He said, well, this is what it means. And he led him to faith in Jesus through the prophet Isaiah. Hallelujah. Some of you know some of the verses that there are in Isaiah. Wonderful scriptures to use in sharing our faith with people. The Old Testament scriptures are God's word to us today just as much as the New Testament scriptures. I just wanted to say that. But let's get back to Abraham. Abraham was a great man of faith, but he also had his doubts. But that didn't stop God from loving him and making him a vital part of his plan of salvation for the world. Because God knew Abraham's heart. And this is where we get to the nitty gritty. In his heart, Abraham trusted in God. He refused to worship any other God. He had his doubts, but he never stopped trusting. I hope you can see the difference. He had his doubts, but he never stopped trusting. Abraham trusted God when everything seemed to be going wrong and he was full of questions and buts. And he didn't stop him trying to sort things out for himself at times, making a real mess of things. But when the chips were down, Abraham knew that God loved him. Do you know God loves you? Have you ever heard that quiet voice when God says, I love you? There was nowhere else Abraham could go except to God. Where else can we go? It's all about trust. Faith is not an intellectual belief. It's not just something we believe is true. Faith is about depending upon God in every part of our lives. It's about acknowledging him as our Lord. It's about submitting to his will in our lives. And through faith, we come into a living relationship with a God who is alive. Not just something written in a book, not a statue in a church building, but the living Lord. And as we do, we come to know him as our Lord and as our Savior who we rely on Day after day after day. He has the final say. And we know he desires only the best for us. That's saving faith. That's not just an intellectual belief. One final thing. Abraham lived out his faith. He went where God sent him. He lived where God told him to live. Why do you live where you do? Interesting question. He did the things God told him to do. How do I know? Well, I've read the story, but also in Hebrews 11 again, and um, I just want to quote this. It says, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. They think it's time. (laughs) Go on then. (laughs) Ah, yeah, it's a long final thing. (laughs) 
Anyway, that was the first thing. He obeyed and he went. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents. It says he was looking forward to the city with foundations. It was architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children. And by faith, Abraham, when tested him, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice, it says. The ultimate test. Offer your only son. The one through whom my promises are going to be fulfilled. And it says, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. That was the man's faith. But it was worked out by what he did. And James, in his uh, epistle, says, Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. It's not enough to say, I believe Jesus died for me. It's not enough. Prove it. Prove it by the way that we live. That's what Abraham did. James goes on to say, Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did? When he offered his son Isaac on the altar, you see his faith and his actions were working together. His faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. But it's the order that matters. We do it because of our faith. Not to be saved, but because we are saved. That's the difference. If we truly believe and trust in Jesus every day, the way we live should demonstrate that. This is the biggest problem that the church has in this country, in my opinion. That many people outside the church see Christians as hypocrites and they're fully justified. Because they see us and the way we live and it doesn't match up to what we say we believe. And that challenge is for me as much as anybody else. I come under the spotlight and so do you. Not God's spotlight, but the spotlight of those who look on from outside and say, well, if that's Christianity, it's a waste of time. People outside the church expect Christians to be holy people. They don't understand that we're also human. They don't understand that we still sin. That's the problem. But don't let that discourage you. Instead, depend on Jesus. The writer of the Hebrews had more to say about this because he, he goes on, you see. He says, this is how it works. And then he says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. What's hindering you? And the sin that so easily entangles. What's the sin that keeps coming back again and again in your life and my life? Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. He's our standard, he's our strength, he's our example. The jo for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It's easy to do that, isn't it? To get weary and lose heart. He goes on, he says, endure hardship, as discipline. God's treating you as his children for what children are not disciplined by their father. The next bad thing that happens, can you and I say, God's chastening me, he's disciplining me. Lord, what's this about? What do you want me to understand from this? It's not easy. Verse 12, he says, therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. I love that. Strengthen your feeble, stand up straight, be a man. That's what he's saying. Come on, do the stuff. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. And then some very practical things. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Every effort. Everything you can possibly do to live at peace with everyone. And be holy. And he goes on and says, See that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile. It's very practical, this faith thing. It's about trusting and doing. You can't separate them. I want to end with um, some verses from Romans chapter 4. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. 
and so became the father of many nations. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. This is when he finally had the child. And that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Isn't it interesting? He did not waver, but he was strengthened in his faith. The more we trust, the more we believe, the more God will build that faith and trust in us. Is your faith strong a weak? Then use it and allow God to make it stronger. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. And then it says the words it was credited to, to, to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus Christ our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Let's pray.